Schwab Advisor Services is proud to support the RIA Edge podcast and equally proud to support independent financial advisors like you. In a challenging year, how did 68% of firms surveyed in Schwab's RIA benchmarking study meet or exceed their new client goals? By following key success factors, such as leveraging new technology, adapting strategies to win new business and stay connected with their clients, while also attracting and developing the right talent. The Schwab RIA benchmarking study is just one of many ways they provide you with the insights and resources needed to succeed and grow. Get the full picture at advisorservices.schwab.com. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the RIA Edge podcast. I'm David Armstrong, the editorial director of wealthmanagement.com. As you know, the RIA Edge podcast is our chance to speak to executives and leaders in the investment advisory space who are building the RIAs of the future, firms that we consider growing by design and not by default. Today, I'm speaking to Mark Hurley. Mark Hurley is the former leader of the Fiduciary Network and now heads up a cybersecurity firm called Digital Privacy and Protection. Mark has been in the industry for a long time and knows the RIA space very well. We spoke here about his recent opus, a nearly 100-page white paper called Welcome to the Jungle, where he lays out in a very thorough way a pretty cogent argument about the trajectory the RIA industry is on, both for good and for bad. It's gotten a lot of attention since he's released it, and I think you'll enjoy our conversation about it. He's always a fascinating person to speak to. This conversation took place at the recent Market Council conference, so forgive maybe what might be some subpar audio quality, but I think you'll enjoy the conversation. So with that, here is my conversation with Mark Hurley. Today's the day you're releasing the white paper publicly. This morning? Yes. It's already out. Uh, But before we get into it, and before we get into some of your opinions on the industry, which I think are, are controversial and necessary and interesting, uh, and kind of a fresh of Fresh air, right? Like, okay. you know, it's a, it's, it's, it's not the sort of stuff that's always discussed, but for the listeners who maybe don't know who you are, can sure. you just give a little background on? Sure. Uh, uh, I've been working in the wealth management space with several different companies over several years. Where I first attained notoriety was back in 1999. I helped co-author a study that predicted the consolidation you see in the industry today, as well as the scale requirements. Uh, it has been often mischaracterized as saying that small companies go out of business and we've never even gotten close to that. We've just said small companies will have to do certain things if they want to continue to prosper. One of the things we talked about in 99 was how they'd have to get a little bit larger. In 1999, a $50 million business was considered small. Today, a $400 million business is small. Now, yes, there's been inflation, but a dollar in 1999 today is worth about a buck eighty-nine. So you're really about a factor of more than four larger to be in the same place you were 25 years ago. And this is just the natural progression in any business. So we published that paper. We published several subsequent updates to that. It's been about eight years since there's been an update. We went through a pretty amazing period as we talk about in the paper. Now that it's over, a lot of people are looking to figure out what to do. And many people I've known in the industry suggested it might be really helpful for people's thinking. No one's going to agree with what we say always. A lot of people are going to disagree with what we say. That's fine. But the idea is to try to stoke a debate that forces people to think through some of these issues. So one of the things that uh, I've always thought about this space, particularly when we're talking about the independent side of the wealth management space, the business of financial advice, is that the a, a 10-year plus bull market in equities has just made everyone look like a genius. Yeah. I tell every owner of a business, if you really want to think about your strategic plan, go back and take out the market between 2012 and now and see where your profitability is. And then you have a better sense of, okay, had we not had the bull market, what would have I had to done and what kind of success I would have had? Now, to be sure, markets go up, markets go down. That's all part of the game. But the real question now is, Unless you think we're going to have a repeat of that, what do you have to do to continue to prosper? We don't think any business is going to go out of business unless they screw cyber up. Mm -hmm. And then the SEC and the trial bar will make sure they go out of business. But there are going to be decisions being made today will determine where businesses are going to be 10 to 15 years from now. And either they're going to be quite large and very, very profitable. They're going to be very specialized and larger than they are today. But very, very profitable, valuable businesses. In fact, I think that's the most interesting category. Or they're going to be generalists and they'll have really not businesses, but they'll wind up with jobs. Mm-hmm. And that's interesting because, you know, I think technology as well plays a role here too, right? I mean, the generalist advisor that you're talking about almost kind of becomes a call center 
employee in a sense, right? I mean, they're they're behind the technology. Well, no, the clients I, interacting with the technology. I, well, I would challenge that a little bit. Fundamentally, what wealth management is about is nothing to do with finance. It, finance is a tool wealth managers use. It is fundamentally about helping people figure out what they're trying to accomplish because money is a means to an end, and then helping them organize their finances and organize multiple aspects of their life so they can achieve their goals. I like to say what really good wealth managers do is they diagnose and solve client problems. And that's that every human being has a complicated relationship with money. Big part of what the wealth manager is doing is helping them manage that relationship they have with their money. So, no, I, I what I actually think, though, is the bigger challenge facing every wealth manager is that big guys are very soon going to start acting like big guys in other industries. And today, if I own a if I'm a prospective client, I go into a person who has $50 million in management. They're going to say, we're going to do A, B, and C for X dollars. And if I go to a guy with $10 billion, he's going to say, we're going to do A, B, C for X dollars. That's going to change. It's already starting to change. The big guys are going to say, no, we do A, B, C, D, F, and G. And the little guys are going to have to respond. What that means is their costs are going to go up significantly. And yes, technology is going to try to help them be more efficient. But that's, that's not going to, that on its own won't do it. And so the challenge will be is, all right, how do you continue to prosper when bigger guys are going to start trying to squeeze you? They also, we're already starting to see the poaching of employees. Mm -hmm. Labor costs are going to go up. Mm -hmm. There is a, a chronic shortage already of talent in this industry. And if Cerulean is correct, 37 percent of the industry is going to retire in the next 10 years. And so if you're someone who's trying to take advantage of the what we believe is a massive upcoming organic growth opportunity. There are 7 million more Americans between the ages of 45 and 60, and there are 60 and 75. You know, I think Cheryl Penny mentioned recently that not too long ago, there were 7 million Americans who were millionaires. Now there's 25 million. So there's a, a staggering growth opportunity out there. But the only way people are going to be able to take advantage of that is to get talent. And there isn't talent takes a long time to develop. So what you're going to see is an all-out war for talent. And this industry, which has been just a wonderful collegial club, as the paper says, is about to turn into a jungle. At war for each other? Try, for try, talent? For Trying to get talent. And, yeah. and the first rule in the jungle, jungle is to not get eaten. Yeah. So if you own a business, you better very quickly figure out how to make sure you keep your best people. Yeah. You know, the, those statistics are thrown around. And I think most people hear it as an opportunity, right? It's like great space to be in because there's just so much opportunity. The hurdles to get into the business are fairly low, right? But yet you're not suggesting that we need hundreds of thousands of more RIAs out there. No, well, uh, it doesn't matter what we need. We're not going to be able to find them. Yeah. It takes, I mean, wealth management is as much about experience and judgment as is the technical skills. And that takes a very long time to build. Also, within the industry, there are a relatively small percentage are very good at marketing. The big crisis facing a lot of firms is that while well, the equity markets went to the moon, they stopped marketing. When your EBTA is going up 15 20% a year, just turn the lights on, why worry about trying to do organic growth? And any organization that's not marketed for a long time, that restart is brutally hard. It requires a cultural reset. It requires different types of people and personalities, a different operating model. For example, most firms, if you're a person who's good at marketing, you go out and you build a book of business for yourself, and at some point, it's full. And you're making a nice living, not working too hard. And that, that's great for you personally, but for the firm, you've taken the, one of the most talented people to bring in clients in and discouraged them from continuing to bring clients in. And what we'll see over time, the most successful firms, is they're going to build operating models that where marketers market full-time. Servicing clients, candidly, is not that complicated. And most people who do it are overpaid. So what you're going to see is a shift in the the remuneration and the value. The people who are very good at marketing, and we spell this out mathematically in the paper, that you could pay them 4 or $5 million a year and still be a great deal provided they produced. By shifting to this, though, you, you would increase the ability to recruit clients four or fivefold. But again, there's a finite pool of people who can do this. Mm -hmm. There's also a lot of equity capital, financial capital, has come into the industry. And capital cares about one thing, return. Mm -hmm. And so, whereas before, most of the people who founded these firms many years ago were missionaries, their friends, the collegial. That's that now we got businesses. Mm -hmm. And the the these people who bought firms have spent a great deal of money to buy them, 
to generate a return, they're going to have to get a lot of organic growth. To get a lot of organic growth, they're going to have to get the people. They're going to have, you know, they're going to, have to do all these things that are competitive, which effectively takes away the the genteel nature of being in wealth management. And and the, the sort of the, the special uh, angelic nature of what the RIA, the independent side, always had, right? But but but, but let's be clear. Independents, including ones that are small today, there's a phenomenal opportunity. This is an industry that has de minimis specialization. Now, if you go back to what I said is, what you're fundamentally doing in wealth management is helping people solve problems. You're going to see, our belief is 200 or so firms are going to emerge. They're going to be extraordinarily specialized. And they're going to go from simply helping people manage their wealth to serving as a much broader advisor will help them build and create their wealth. Mm -hmm. So, for example... Some wealth management firm will emerge, say, that is, has a real understanding of the career paths and the remuneration and, and wealth building opportunities for, say, an AI software engineer. Mm -hmm. And the firm that gets the brand as the firm that does that, every AI software engineer is going to find them because they need that specialized advice. They need someone who really understands all the nuances, the opportunities, what should I be doing, how do I negotiate my next contract. And as well as provide comprehensive, holistic wealth management. There is opportunity for many of these subspecialties to be created. And in any other industry you look at, when someone builds a specialty, almost immediately they start to have a capacity problem. Because what they've created is a pull marketing strategy. Where what they're doing pulls people to them as opposed to having to spend lots of money to push their ideas out to other people. Yeah. Uh, and then we get in the paper, we get into fairly granular describing this and what we often do is we have many firms will come to us and we're happy to talk but anybody help them help them sort of think through all right how do you create this specialty you know what and most firms kind of have a subspecialty just haven't really formalized it but we're talking about getting much much broader expertise in a much narrower space. Yeah, you're not talking about specialties uh, like uh, business owners in general. That, right? that is, that is, that is that, 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 like even doctors. Yeah. Uh, we go through this in the paper, but if you look at, say, what a dermatologist business looks like versus what an anesthesiologist versus a surgeon, uh, dermatology businesses are capital intensive businesses involving lasers for cosmetic. That's most of the economics. Mm -hmm. Anesthesiologists are volume businesses. Knock them out, bring them back. Mm -hmm. And surgeons, most surgeons make most of the remuneration based on owning surgery centers and rehab centers. The actual procedures are a very small percent of the revenue. All those things bring a whole different set of complexities and issues and need for understanding. But to go back to the dermatology example, uh, where I live in Fort Worth, Dallas Fort Worth area, it's a small enough specialty so that if you became the firm for that, you could actually dominate it, which is what's ideal for being a niche competitor. There's only 300 dermatologists in a, an area where there's 8 million people. What you want to find is not a market that's enormous. We actually want to find something that is large enough so you can make a fair amount of money, but small enough so it's not worth the big guys building the same specialty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then once you've built the brand on that, then you've got a phenomenal business. Now, we also think at some point people with similar specialties in different markets will start to merge. And then at some point they will buy some other firms with other specialty type practices. And so when we talk about the future structure of the industry, yes, there are going to be these giant mega firms, and you can see some of the ones that are emerging. But there are also going to be this middle section, 200, 250 firms, that are going to have between five and $100 billion, and they're going to be insanely valuable businesses, making lots of money, doing incredible things for their clients, which really is the real purpose to get into wealth management anyway. It's not so much the economics. And for those 200 and 400 that you're predicting will kind of fall out in this middle space, the hyper specialization is the key. Absolutely. And you could see a universe where those firms merge. And so you might have an Uber firm of hyper specialized. Yeah, I'll give you some example. Let's say I became a specialist in working with uh, used car dealers on the West Coast. Mm -hmm. And I became the place to go if you had a used car dealership. Probably someone else is doing it on the East Coast. And so at some point, we got the business large enough, we might to get some more scale, yeah. merge the two businesses together. It's interesting, though, because you're also talking then about a, a skill set or a knowledge base that you know goes far beyond what advisors traditionally have, right? I mean, if, if I want to be the used car guy, you know, the advisor to all the used car dealers, owners on the East, West Coast, i got to know a lot about the used car Immense business. Immense amount about the Far business. more about that than I have to about how to put together an ETF well, portfolio of, you well, know. Technology is commoditizing financial planning. Yeah. Technolo I mean, it won't commoditize this 
problem diagnosis, this helping people manage their relationship with money. That, that's the real core value in a lot of ways. But the other stuff, technology is automating a lot of this. And so, yes, it's important to get a CFP. Yes, CFAs are great. But there are so many of them, it's, it's a commodity. And that's why I say the client servicing function is increasingly going to be paid a lot less because it, it, so much of it can be automated, so much of it can be handled by people who candidly, this is really what they want to do and can do and are willing to make, you know, make, where maybe today they make 300000 a year, maybe they make $150,000 a year doing something like this. Mm-hmm. Whereas the people who can bring clients in, and the business of wealth management is not uh, advising people, the business is getting paid to advise people. Mm-hmm. Marketing is the fundamental business there. Those people will be in immense demand. And that's where I think you'll see a lot of the poaching. They don't even care if they bring their clients with them. One other thing we talk about in the paper, which is a, a wee bit controversial, is we walk through how to game a non-compete. And a two-year non-compete can be game. It, it, for, mm-hmm. a, it, you know, if you presume you're going to protect your clients, your employees, and your business through restrictive covenants, you get some benefit. We're not saying get rid of them, but don't presume that. You've got to figure out very quickly how to make it so it is economically unattractive for your best people to go anywhere else. And we started to see this too, right? I mean, uh, the it used to be the the breakaways leaving the warehouses. Maybe there was some you know illegal action taken there. Yeah. But now you're seeing it amongst the RA space. Well, Edelman, I think, just brought action against Mariner. Mm-hmm. Yes, right. You know, I, 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 you know it, for someone who writes papers, we started this thing a year ago, and you have all these ideas, and uh, it's a relief, I guess, when you're finally about some to put the paper out and you see some people do some of the things you're predicting. Yeah, and you see, you will see more of that kind of. Well, like, for example, if you look what Creative uh, Planning is doing, we've talked about the big guys doing much more for the same dollars. Go look at what they're doing. And this is a big, well-run firm. Mm-hmm. And so if you're operating a, uh, a big firm, first thing you've got to make sure, well, or any firm, you got to make sure you think about this in terms of 10 to 15 years. You don't think of this in the next five years. Because what's the real opportunity is organic growth. And organic growth is hard, brutally hard, lengthy, gradual process. It requires investments. It requires patience. And then eventually it pays off. And with organic growth right now, the cost of acquiring a client is a fraction of the present value of the client. And in the paper, we go through the math of all this and spell it out. Right now, if you've got a $2 million client, it was 45. And let's say they saved on average 100000 a year for the next 20 years when they retire. That client, on a present value basis, would be worth about $600,000. The cost of acquiring that client today, probably 20 to 30 grand if you really did full cost accounting. Okay, how could you get something worth $600,000 for 30 grand? Mm -hmm. Well, you can for a while, but at some point the market's correct. And so clients that are gotten in the next, say, seven to eight years are going to be much more valuable in terms of the value they create in the enterprise than for the next eight to 15 years. So this is a race. How do you quickly take advantage of this land grab before the costs go up? The costs going up presume that uh, there are other firms coming in that are also making a play for that client, right? Yeah. And that's what's going to happen. Yeah. Every wealth manager I talk to today tells me that when they compete for a client already, there's always a couple other people there. Yeah. What if there were 20? Yeah. And 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 I think about this. How do you raise the costs in marketing? Well, for example, people will try to build their own referral networks. And what they'll do is have someone go out and get to know the people, et cetera. The next stage in this will be you'll start seeing wealth manager firms sponsoring events for say that we were groups that affiliate, that's expensive. Mm-hmm. Then you'll start seeing them developing extra skills and tools for the to help these parties. In other words, it's a constant. How do I make it so that I'm the compelling opportunity to come to? And uh, eventually, the, the the cost of acquisition, the present value of the cost of acquisition, converges much more closely to the actual value of the client, and so you generate, as economists would say, a normal return. Right now, it's ridiculous. As someone who studies the industry for the last 25 years, it's sort of absurd that even though you had this raging bull market and all these M&A opportunities, why would anyone have neglected organic growth when these clients are so incredibly valuable? And most of the industry did. Yeah. Well, and I'll tell you the argument there that I've heard uh, is that there's really no organic growth to be had. Oh, uh, it's You think that's not true? Baloney. Yeah. Yeah. I and mean, there are some people, you know, say back out the market appreciation and it's just like the, the pie is not getting any bigger. Oh, yes. no. If just demographics alone. As a boomer, of course, I like to think we're the most important generation. <laughs> but uh, And everyone thinks we're the largest generation. We're not. The, the, the 15 years behind us is, is substantially bigger. And the amount of wealth that's been created in the state is, is immense. Uh, now, 
the question will be, you say, there are no more clients to be gotten. One, there's wealth being created every day, so that, that's just belonging. But also, we have this sort of rule that once you have a client, you have it forever. Find me an industry where that happens. Yeah. Yeah. And what you're going to increasingly see are big guys are going to offer to do a lot more. Specialists are going to offer to provide services that other advisors can't. And you're going to see clients go, look, I love you. I've been with you for a while, but I need that what this guy does, and I'm going to move over here. Yeah. And the people who are caught in the middle of this are going to be the generals. So what does that general look like then? We're, we're, we're... Today, they can range from anywhere from, well, first off, to be sure, every firm is a generalist right now. There's really no specialists. Yeah. There are big generalists, and there are smaller generalists. Yeah. And a good chunk of the center of the industry has been hollowed out uh, through acquisitions. Mm-hmm. The big generalists are going to have to get much, much bigger. And they are. And one of the questions that will be is how they actually brand themselves. I find sort of silly if you look at some of the brands that some of the really big firms have adopted. I don't even know what the brand says. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's kind of silly. And if you look at very successful accounting and law firms, what they've done is they have a national brand, but they have a series of sub-brands that go directly to where their expertise is. And I think that's what the winners are going to do on the big side. The small guys... It's it, they're going to evolve into like the local bookkeeper. You know, it's a nice job. People like them. They go to work every day, but there's nothing really to sell mm-hmm. when, they're, when they're done done working. Within that group of the small journalists, I believe, is where you're going to see the specialists emerge. And there are at least, you know, 200 plus owners of businesses who are going to, in 15 years, ever going to go, how the heck did they build that thing? Mm-hmm. Uh, this is why it's such an exciting time to be in this business. Tons of potential clients, very little specialization. It's open field. It'd be one thing if we had 100 firms that are already the specialists, so you have to find some sort of new specialty. There really are none today. And that, to me, I think is the big opportunity if you're a smaller firm. If you're a bigger firm, you better, you know, you've got this window for organic growth. Most of the bigger firms have acquired firms that have stopped marketing. They got a monumental challenge to try to get that going again. Many are uh, addicted, for lack of a better term, to custodial referrals. Mm-hmm. And I quote in a paper a famous money manager who said to me, "You know, it's a lot like cocaine. If you get addicted, it'll kill you." <laughs> uh, uh, and I and that's not sustainable. And the economics of those things have been very attractive because the market rally has made them very attractive. Mm-hmm. But if we don't have the same market rally, they're not going to be as attractive. I'm pretty sure people will still take them, but that's not how you'll build real economic value in your business. The, the way you will do that is by building your own uh, center of influence referral networks, which takes a long time, it's expensive, it's hard, and it's uncertain. We invite you to join us on May 13th through 16th in Hollywood, Florida, for RA Edge, part of the Wealth Management Edge event. With an agenda designed to help accelerate the growth of your RAA firm with the latest C-suite strategies, you'll walk away with frameworks and approaches for M&A, organic growth, and talent development. Use promo code PODCAST20 to save 20% on your registration. Visit wealthmanagementedge-event.com for more information. So let's talk about the the custodians and the, the larger players in the space, because I think one of the things that everyone understands at that level is that the the economics of being a custodian are pretty miserable. The economics of being an RIA are great. Everyone wants to buy into the economics of the RIA, wants to get into that space, whether they say it or not. They see that as being more the, the higher margin, stickier revenue. That's where they want to be. They'll start investing a little bit. They'll start doing their well, own wealth management. There's one exception, does. and that, that's Pershing, which is Pershing is the part of Boney, which is mm-hmm. the, the Godzilla of custodians. Mm-hmm. And they make a lot of money running a great business. Schwab's already have his enormous advice arm. And yeah. Fidelity's building an enormous advice arm. Yeah. The, the better question, I would argue, is, okay, they're feeding clients to aggregators who, by any measure, are going to become direct competitors with them. Or if you're an aggregator, if you're relying on them for, for your growth, do you really believe they're going to continue to feed you clients? And those programs, they can change not just who participates, they can change the economics of it on, at will. Mm-hmm. And so what I think you'll actually see is those programs will continue to exist. They have, they clearly are beneficial at the margin, but they're, they're not the core of what growth will be. The winners are going to be people who figure out the, the branding, the marketing, the how do you position your firm specifically. Now, in brands, one of the more controversial things I think we point out in the thing is that no one really has a brand that matters. Mm-hmm. 
And the reason is, is if a brand mattered, it would draw lots of clients to you. Most even the largest wealth managers I know, they don't even know in their own market. Mm-hmm. And where Schwab and Fidelity, I mean, Schwab spends $485 million a year on market. Those are big brands. That's a heck of a brand. They, they have so many clients come into their branches that they have to send 14000 out because they can't handle all they got. What you'll and no one can afford to spend four eighty five, even the biggest aggregators. What you're going to see is the people who build the really smart brands are going to have this one national brand and a bunch of sub brands that target certain segments of clients, and they're going to be built around communicating their expertise in solving problems. Schwab's brand and Fidelity's brand communicate size and safety and competence. Mm-hmm. The the competitors who are going to win are going to have it much more detailed. If you're a person with this issue, we're the place to come to. We, we're the experts on this. We work with lots of people just like you. So it's a specialty, but it's a large enough specialty so it makes sense for the a bigger firm to go after it as opposed to the small specialists. And the same token, though, it still requires an enhanced expertise to help the other party. I guess my question then would be for when you predict that the, the large players will emerge, the smaller niche players will emerge, Why? what's preventing the largest players, the Fidelities, the Schwabs, even the Merrill Lynch's and the LPLs of the world from just rolling over what the REA aggregators have built in this space. Oh, no, I'm, that wouldn't worry me at all. First off, the market is $57 trillion. The largest uh, market share is still de minimis. Additionally, the demand for the service, as I said, is going to continue to climb. As much as it looks like, in one sense, mature, it's not mature at all. Where it's mature is the M&A market. 100 buyers quickly rationalize the market. And you can't make money by doing acquisitions. You make your money by what happens after the acquisition. Mm-hmm. Well, whereas there was a decade there where you could borrow lots of cheap money and buy things and prices were what? that, And then the market yep. kept going up so that no matter what you did, you made money. Yep. Okay, those that was great. We're all going to look back on that with a misty-eyed look, but it's not going to continue going forward. The big Schwab, I think, will continue to be very, very successful and grow. Clearly, its wealth management arm is going to continue to grow quite well. Fidelity, I would never bet against Abby Johnson on anything, period, end of discussion. But the market's so enormous that there's going to be 30 to 50 mega firms, and Schwab will be one. Okay. Fidelity will be one. So Merrill, Creative planning will be one. What? Creative planning will be one. Uh, maybe. Well, I, I, let me just say. Uh, I'm not picking on them specifically. I'm just well, like, I think talking about the they, largest RIAs. I, well, I also think they, they have a, a leader who is uh, very visionary mm-hmm. and uh, thinks in the context of 15 years, not in the context of two years. Yeah. That gives them an enormous competitive advantage. So I think they're well positioned. And what acquisitions have done, they've already integrated them. I mean, the real challenge for a lot of the aggregators is they were so busy buying stuff that there's there's a small number that have done a great job of having fully integrated businesses. And then most of them are effectively confederations of small businesses that have stopped growing. Mm-hmm. And so now the leadership has this massive challenge to reset the culture, to refocus the organization, to rationalize it, build a brand. This is why we think the most successful organizations are going to be run by business operators. Mm-hmm. Uh, founders who are smart will bring in a business operator. Not all of the management of the aggregators are business operators. I think they at some point will bring people in who are business operators to do this. You said something interesting on the stage yesterday, so it's, uh, it's kind of sad in a way. It's like Walmart coming into town. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, what, what you have going on is the normal market forces. Go back to 1999 when I wrote that first paper. It was so controversial. There were industry events back then where there would be panels where people would debate topics. And one of the topics that was being debated was that if you worked more than three days a week, would you be so overwhelmed that you really couldn't do a good job for your clients? Hmm. And that was because the industry was so easy. The, the industry got started because of an obscure tax rule change in 1979. It's promulgated the 78 Tax Reform Act. We all know it. It's called Rule 401k. And it allowed companies to get out of the pension business. They got out as quickly as they could. And then all of a sudden, an entire generation of boomers woke up and realized, if I don't get comprehensive holistic advice, I'm going to be living under a bridge in my retirement. And so what, 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 what happened was is the demand for advice so exceeded the supply that you didn't have to raise capital. You just hung out a shingle. And six months later, you're making money. Mm-hmm. So you want sad. Those are the great days. Yeah. And... 
most of the people who came in were missionaries. They really weren't business people. They just wanted to help people. Today, this is starting to look like any other industry. Now, it's also a great, you know, the happy side of this is if you really want to help people, you really want to do a great job working with people, this period, if, particularly on a specialization side, is the greatest time ever. It's still completely virgin territory. You can change a lot of people's lives, clients, for the better, and build a phenomenal business. Uh, yes, you have to work harder. You have to get a little bit bigger. But that's every business has that. And there's a tidal wave of potential clients coming over the transom. And in a sense, this is actually a very happy time, too. Yeah, there'll be some big stores down the street, mm-hmm. Walmarts, but the opportunity is probably as good as it's ever been in the industry. That's fascinating. I, I, I want to wrap up by asking you about cybersecurity because you call it like the one big existential threat to the industry. Yes. Cyber. Yeah. The SEC has proposed a series of rules that have not yet promulgated. Or they just formally formalized the ones uh, and did. They're, they're now in effect for public companies. But the SEC for, has been very reasonable in understanding that cybersecurity is one of the biggest threats in the, in the world to wealth. And wealth managers at their core manage risk to wealth. And they took a position in their proposed rules where they said, we think wealth managers don't spend enough, or RIAs don't, don't spend enough on cybersecurity. And they equated having good cybersecurity with meeting one's fiduciary duties. The big changes that are going to dramatically shake the industry, one is disclosure. Every wealth manager is going to have to disclose to their clients the cyber risk from using their service. And they are, one, what happens if the wealth manager gets breached? And equally important, the custodian agreements that the clients have to sign to use the wealth manager services shift all of the cybersecurity risk onto the client. Mm. So imagine going to a client and they have their entire net worth in that custodial account or most of it, and you're going to say, by the way, if it gets hacked, you're not getting your money back. And after the client passes out, then they're going to say, what do I do to help you? Now, what we argue in the paper is these changes are coming. This is, this is inevitable. Well, why not take advantage of it? Upgrade your cyber defenses because you're going to have to, mm-hmm. but instead use it as an advantage. Say, look, look what we do to help protect you. And we have to, we'll disclose to you what we do because we have to. And look, we're not only just going to help you with, we're not just going to have strong protections at our level. We're going to help you with your cybersecurity because we don't want you to have that kind of risk. That's what the winners are going to do. In fact, that's what the winners are already starting to do. Uh, when will the rules get finalized? It should be relatively soon. Mm-hmm. My personal prediction is about 90% of the industry will ignore them. Mm-hmm. Then some people get breached. The SEC will put some people's heads on sticks. Mm-hmm. And amazingly, you'll see this panic to try to catch up. Yeah, yeah. I, it, it's, it still strikes me that uh, cyber, it's thought of as such a sleepy little corner, you know, of the, of the office. It's, uh, you know, because I think because people have not necessarily go, confronted. Go, back, go the, back to 2002, 2005 time period. Think about compliance. Yeah. There was an idea you had to have a compliance officer. It was like, oh, yeah. come on, you right. got to be joking. And then all of a sudden... The whole world revolves around compliance. Same thing is about to happen with cyber. We, we published an article, uh, we say, a uh, co-author with somebody who said, if you think you hate your compliance officer, wait till you meet the CISO. Mm-hmm. Because their job is going to be say no on, on everything. But again, like all this stuff is, it's change. And change involves both work and opportunity. The most successful firms going forward are going to be the first movers. They're the ones who are going to take the steps to take advantage of what's coming as opposed to simply reacting to what's coming. And we're already seeing some firms starting to do that, both big and small. Mm -hmm. And those who do that are going to prosper. They're going to have phenomenal businesses. Mm -hmm. Any predictions on the firms that will fall out, that will not survive? Uh, Well, again, everyone survives. You've kind of quantified some of this a little bit. Well, first off, everyone survives unless they screw cyber up. Okay. Let me explain what happens. If you get breached and you've not done anything close to industry's best practices, which are, is going to be a very high standard because it's based on larger companies, you should expect first you're going to get sued. The trial bar has figured out this is a happy hunting ground. And you'll get sued because client information is can be sold for $1,000 a file in the aftermarket. And then client assets get stolen, got to help you. And your cyber insurance won't protect you. Mm-hmm. Uh, number two, you're going to get an enforcement action. And the SEC has made a point of not just giving the enforcement action to the organization, but also to people at the organization. Mm-hmm. They're doing this right now with a public company that had a breach on its platform, and they, they sanctioned one of the senior executives there personally. You're then going to have to disclose this to the whole world. In other words, if you get breached, you have to self-report under the new rules in 48 hours. 
You then have to put it into your Form ADV, and you have to tell every client what happened and why. Hmm. Oh, and by the way, the custodians are not taking the moral hazard risk here. They're the deep pocket. And what they've done often already is they fire you. They send you, they'll literally send all of your clients a letter saying, your, your advisor has inadequate cybersecurity, you need to find another custodian. So this is the one thing that kill you. Now, the, the, the group that won't die, but shall we say will have less fun, are, are going to be generalists. They're mm-hmm. going to be people who simply react to the changes. Mm-hmm. You know, they say, look, I'm making a lot of money. It helps that my EBITDA is 6x what it was a decade ago, simply because the market went up. And slowly watch that drip, 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 drip down. And when they're done, they'll have nothing to sell, but, you know, they'll have had a great career. Mm-hmm. They've helped people. And then... They'll close the, you know, they'll hand it off to someone else for nothing, yeah. effectively. You talked about the, the this will be my last one because I know we're running out of time, but uh, the increasing cost of client acquisition, which is coming, uh, the pressure on providing more services for the big ones uh, and the hyper niche being deep experts in those areas, the PE firm, the PE money that has mm. flown into the space will just, you know, it's all a calculation, right? It's, they're looking for a return. Yeah, well, no, the money. PE firms have an interesting calculation right now. And it drives their behavior. They have raised so much money, $2.2 trillion since 2016, that if you look at the economics of the owners of PE firms, it's driven by the management fees, not the investment returns, not the carried interest. And so their biological imperatives put money to work. And so you may still see a little bit of crazy acquisition stuff for a while, but without the cheap debt, that's going to be harder and so many buyers. But the last thing they want to do is sell an aggregator because they've got a ton of money into it. And what they've done repeatedly, many of the aggregators, is when the investment from one fund starts to mature, they sell it to another fund. Roll it over. Yeah. Just keep rolling it over. Now, what we think will change at some point is the people who give them money, a lot of which are the sovereign funds, mm-hmm. are going to say, this is kind of crazy. And also, a large wealth management firm, one of these really big firms, would be an ideal asset to be owned by a sovereign fund because they're investing for decades. You know, this, this is really intergenerational wealth with their, for the country. And owning a, a very large wealth management firm in a business that's growing, that they could hold for decades, quite candidly, all the cash they're getting back, they can put right back into the business to continue to make it a grow. Very attractive. My argument is that uh, at some point, one of those people are going to tell the PE firms, no, 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 we're just going to own it. Mm-hmm. They often have co-investment rights. It's very fairly standard right now. And they'll just tell them, no, we're not going to sell. We're just going to take it and have it ourselves. Mm-hmm. The one model that will fail, in my view, is the public company model. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the reason is is that when it's M&A, yes, having public and a currency helps you do what you're going to do. But when you know, it's all organic growth, which is very much a takes many years to build and realize the value, you can't be worrying about next quarter's earnings. So I think the, the public play is kind of gone. Mm-hmm. Uh, or, or, and you know, there's one big firm just went private. I think you'll see more go private. Uh, the, the public route is a great way to destroy guy yeah. in one of these businesses. Many kind of public. walked up to the edge and then pulled back as well, right? I mean, yeah, we've seen that. Yeah, that's right. And, and, and now also the aggregators themselves and their PE backers, they, they rationally took advantage of what was a rising tide and bet heavily on it. Mm-hmm. And their their investors should hold a parade in their honor. That much said, some of the sins of the earlier years are coming back to, to deal with. Uh, you know, they're scrambling to refinance. A lot of them are. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're having to sort of rethink. Okay, we have all these firms we bought up as quickly as we could. We made a lot of money. All right, what do we do with them? Mm-hmm. How do we rationalize them? Mm-hmm. Uh, and you've seen some leadership changes because of this in these organizations to try to rationalize this. Mm-hmm. But again, the people who run the PE firms are not. They're, I mean, they're very smart people. They, they, they'll figure this out. I think the financial engineering aspect of this industry has been rationalized. It's really the organic growth. This is going to be an execution business. That's why operators are going to be so important. People who love the day-to-day details, step-by-step, you know, street-to-street, house-to-house, hand-to-hand combat, building the business over time. Yeah. This has been fascinating. It's a, been a great conversation. Chris. Schwab Advisor Services is proud to support the RIA Edge podcast and equally proud to support independent financial advisors like you. In a challenging year, how did 68% of firms surveyed in Schwab's RIA benchmarking study meet or exceed their new client goals? By following key success factors, such as leveraging new technology, adapting strategies to win new business and stay connected with their clients, while also attracting and developing the right talent. 
The Schwab RIA benchmarking study is just one of many ways they provide you with the insights and resources needed to succeed and grow. Get the full picture at advisorservices.schwab.com.